So, all right, well, thank you all for intentionally choosing to come to this workshop. <laughs> We're trying. Um, we do, like she said, have the handout. Um, I guess we'll see if I stick to it or not, okay? And if not, you can get the official what we were gonna do later, but we're, we're just gonna see how it goes today, okay? So um, I think I must have been in the mood to talk about my kids. Let's see, am I getting it right? So this is a picture of two of my daughters in 2012. And we were on a camping trip up in Minnesota and it was really fun. It was about this time of year. And this path through the woods, we were going on a hike and my, that youngest daughter there, she, she loves to hike, but she was young enough that she was struggling to read maps and things. And so we were worried that she could get lost. And they were running on ahead of us and our older sister, she was better at it, but she's not the best navigator. She'd never been in these woods before. And there were a lot of people going through the woods that day. And so our concern was, was she going to take the right path? If she took the right path, would we even find her? You know, how you would as your parents. And I think that's really similar to parenting. There's a lot of voices, and we don't know which path to take. And we struggle to even wonder if we know how to read the map. I mean, we don't even have a map sometimes, okay? So that's where, that's where I'm coming from at this. And I, you know, the, if you've had that feeling of isolation and you don't know who to ask for advice, I definitely know what that feeling felt like. And so, okay, I'm gonna put my clock up here because I'm scared. You know what, someone tell me when it's 2.45. Can you do that for me? And if, maybe I'll be done. So, um, I have a lot of verses, but I'm gonna go fast, and they're on your handout, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read them off my notes. But Jeremiah 6.16, Yehovah says to stand in the ways. And the Hebrew word there, I like Hebrew. If you don't know me very well, I really like Hebrew. It's so fun, it adds this beautiful picture to everything. So when you see what he's intending with his Hebrew word pictures or Hebrew, just the letters and the understanding is so much better than English. So I apologize in advance for, I'm not trying to be like all smart or anything. I just looked it up in my blue letter Bible. Okay. So it was not anything too, too crazy, but the Hebrew word here is Derek and it's, and I have been um, enjoying midwifery topics for about 25 years. I love all those topics. It's my hobby. I I have to do all my work before I get to play with that. But having said that, this word ra'ah is what a midwife does. And I can prove it. It's in Exodus 1.16. The two Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, Pharaoh said to them, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and examine them on the birth stools, ra'ah. Cool, I think it's so cool. So what does a midwife do? She examines, she's trying to find out, okay, are, what are the problems going on? Or maybe everything's going great, but I'm just gonna be always observing. So that's what we're supposed to do. Stand in these paths and ra'ah. Kind of evaluate, how are things going? How's this job going? Or is it moving along as it should? Or should we bring in some extra help? Okay, we need to examine the roads of parenting as well. There are a lot of different paths to parenting, and people will say, there's lots of different ways to parent. You just don't worry about it. It's all good. But where do all those parenting ways start, and where are they going to end, and what are the dangers that you are going to experience if you choose that path? And I really think we should be honest about it. So Yehovah says, stand in the ways and see and ask. And this word is shalu. It means to, usually to pray, but it means to, to ask or to draw out something that you don't know. And that is exactly what it is for parenting. They don't come with an instruction manual. So we're going to shalu. Let's, let's, let's ask, let's examine something I don't know and search it out. So he also says these are old ways that we're supposed to be looking for. The Hebrew word here is olam, which was usually translated everlasting, but it means from antiquity or from a time that you've never been to in a far distant past, or it could be in the future, but far distant past, it's out of sight of modern eyes. This is way out of what you know, okay? And that's what you're looking for. And they are trails, and the word for trails is nitivot, and that's Strong's 5410. Again, this is on your handout. But these are routes that were taken by ancient travelers through the Middle East, and we have not been on those routes. And that he was speaking in Jeremiah to people who had not been on those routes either. They were being dispersed out of the land like the nation of Israel was. So he's saying, 
These are old ancient paths. You're gonna have to search for them. You don't know what you're doing here. This is all new territory for you. But Yehovah says they are good. I told you guys, I really love this word. Am I on the right path? Nope. It's not working, is it? Is it glitching the whole time? So you're not seeing all the Hebrew words. There it is. Maybe? Is that right? Okay, we're on good. Tov. It's okay. No worries. No worries. I can talk without it. But <laughs> it's Tov. Exactly. Exactly. So we are looking for roads that are productive, that they'll actually get you what you are needing out of, out of whatever you're searching for. So, um, of course, these are the ways that you should walk in, okay? Um, and walking is halakha. So you, any of these words you're recognizing, maybe if you've been in Torah a little while, this is your custom, your lifestyle. This should become your habit, okay? And I know that you're gonna have a session on habits later. And surprisingly, if you take this path that is the less traveled path, you will find, and I said that on purpose, because the word find is metza. It's a little close to matzah, and not quite exactly, but you're gonna find accidentally stumble across some brand new discovery if you'll go back to those ancient paths and you will find rest. Now this is not Amy's favorite word, shalomi. This is not this rest, okay? <laughs> um, and I thought that was cool. This is margao and it is refreshment, calm, tranquility, the absence of movement or drama. I thought that was awesome. It's an oasis. This is what you will find if you'll take these ancient paths. So when Yehovah spoke this promise to the people, am I on the right slide now? Because this one's important, if it will go. He said, they, when he spoke this promise to the people in Jeremiah, they said, no, we will not walk in it. That's what it said in Jeremiah. Which, hmm. So last November, my husband and I snuck away for our 30th wedding anniversary. We went up near Traverse City, and on the very last day, we went to an antique shop that was really awesome. We wish we hadn't gone there on the last day because it was the best place we went to, and it had four floors. But down in the basement, there was a whole section of antique kitchen stuff. And there was an antique uh, high chair and antique plates, and I was just having so much fun. And I really thought that their furniture was much more practical than those big monstrosities of, of um, high chairs that we get nowadays. And I do not have room in my house for things. I don't have any little ones at the moment, but thinking grandma kind of stuff. And I was like, that is practical. Um, but look at that, that chair. Um, would a modern toddler stay in that chair. <laughs> there is no seatbelt, okay? And it would be really easy for them to lift that tray up and just zoom on out, okay? Look at the plate. That is in case, you, you can't feel it like I could. That is a ceramic baby plate. Yeah. Would a modern child just throw it on the floor and break it? So these ancient people that Yehovah was talking about, obviously, he wants us to go down those paths. Those ancient people from antiquity at the antique shop obviously might have done something different in their parenting than modern parents. I just want you to think about that, okay? There's something different here. And I'm thinking to myself, is there something I'm not understanding about parenting? So in 1985, before, not, not 85, good grief, 1995, before my first son was born, I would get off work every day and uh, went to the library. And I love libraries, and so my decision was, my husband was, was working another job, and I had time, so I'm like, I'm going to read every single book on parenting that I can get. She's not, he's not bothering us. So we were, um, we would go in, I would get all these books, and I would read them, and I really think I read every popular parenting book that was on the market at that time. I made a list of some of them. I know I read Dr. Spock, What to Expect When You're Expecting, Dr. William Sears, The Continuum Concept, The Montessori Baby, Your Baby and Child. There was a whole bunch of books by the Dolmans. Do you guys recognizing these titles, especially old people like me? So, um, but after our son was born, as long as my husband and I followed the advice that we had read, we did not have that peace and that rest in our home. And I'm like, what? I read all the books. I do not understand what we're doing wrong. I know what to do. I, I, I like reading books. So a friend directed me to Psalm 1, and she said, Anne, I just want to ask you a question. What is the character 
of the authors of the books that you're reading. And I'm like, they are nice people. I have read about them in their books. They sound awesome. And, and I like the tone that they use in their books, and they sound like they're experts. They are experts. And she goes, Anne, but I want you to read these verses. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of Yehovah, and in his Torah he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And I knew these were smart and good and kind people, but they believed in evolution. There's one thing right there you can tell in their books. They don't think the Bible is actually true. They're just nice. But according to these verses, not my words, but according to these verses, they're ungodly. They're sinners. They're scornful. They scorn the truth of the word of Elohim. So how am I supposed to find people who don't do that? It's not like I can get those books. You know. So Yehovah's path sounds a little bit narrow and difficult and lonely. And Yeshua did actually say that. Okay, we're going to get to parenting, I promise. He said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Yeshua also said in that same passage, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn brushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. By their fruits, you will know them. Am I up on the fruits? Yes. He told us to know them by their fruits. So how? Okay. We can, you can't go to the library and look at the author's children. I mean, usually it's kind of creepy for them to put them too much. I put my kids, I guess, up on the screen today, but it's generally creepy. So what would I be looking for if I could look at their children? Okay, let's just talk about that. If we go to 2 Corinthians, I'm laughing at myself because my note says 2020, but that is not the right note. You're going to have to go to your notes because there's no 20 in 2 Corinthians. I don't know what it is. But <laughs> Paul lists out some fruit that we would definitely not want to see in a home, if these are people we're following, okay? And these would be contentions and jealousies, and that's not working. Outbursts, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, and tumults. Now, that's a lot of stuff to look for for bad fruit. If you think about a home life and how it is characterized, and it has these kinds of things in it to my, well, I'll be honest, when I was looking at this verse, I thought, I can think of a lot of days that that sounded like my home. I really can, you know. My husband and I are just not seeing eye to eye on this parenting stuff, or a lot of other things. And I'm batting that that's true of all kinds of parents, parenting books and their authors, and it is accepted in our culture. Was just told, well, that's just how we are. We're just human. We should just let each other be human. So in the same way, though, when we look for godly advice in our homes, we need to look for people whose lives exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And you, this is stuff you guys know. And as we walk in the path of the old path, the right path, we will know it's the right one when that's the kind of fruit we start seeing in our homes. So that fruit would be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. I have to find this path, right? We have to find these teachers. We have to find this advice. And if we will know it's the right advice when that's the fruit we start getting. Of course, it's going to be little buds of fruit first. It's not going to all just overnight. But you'll start to see that that tree growing. Those You can see leaves, right, at least. So this is what you're looking for, okay? So one of my favorite promises, really, literally, this is probably my favorite promise in the Bible. I think I'm on the right one. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, says Yehovah, this is my covenant, my promise to them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth, all of you who have come to his Torah, 
shall not depart from your mouth or from the mouth of your descendants or the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says Yehovah, from this time and forevermore. Holy cow, we are women of Israel and this is our promise. Um, and I can prove it, so let's look at the verse. You don't have your Bibles open, but trust me, this next one is the verse, oops, yeah. This is the verse right before that promise, and it says, the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob. Anyone here turned from transgression and turned to follow his Torah back to Zion? This promise is to us. So how do we, wait a minute, how does that work, okay? Well, this promise is to those who turn from transgression. It is to those who are clearly in covenant. It's to those who are clearly repentant. It is to those who have turned from their transgressions. Okay, so does anyone know the word for turn? It's to shoo, yeah, right, shoo, or. So to return to the to previous place is what that word means. To go back to where you were supposed to be in the first place, right? That's, we all know this. This is why we've come to, into Torah. We want to go back. Isaiah 30, 15 says, Thus says Yehovah Elohim, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. So only we would turn back to his covenant and his Torah and his instructions. And then this is what the next part of that verse says. But you would not. Okay? Kind of funny. All right, so let's look at another passage. And this is a passage I'm going to camp out for just a second on. In fact, I'll probably stay mostly here. So if you have, if you're a person that likes to open a Bible, this will be a good time. So Deuteronomy 30. And I'm going to skip around a little bit. In your notes, you have the whole thing, I think, written out too. I forgot about that. So Deuteronomy 30, verse 2 says, When you return, okay, Shuv, to Yehovah your Elohim and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 6. Yehovah your Elohim will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Yehovah doesn't want behavioralism. He doesn't want psychology. He wants permanent change, permanent cuts to the flesh. No going back. That's what he wants, okay? And he wants it for you and your children that you may live. Proverbs 29, 17 says, correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Um, one of the saddest stories in the, in the whole Bible is 1 Samuel chapter three, and he, we, it's a terrible story. Um, Eli had more time for ministry and helping others than he did for his own sons. Um, and they stood by the gates of the tabernacle. What a privilege. And did perverted, awful things. Why did he not stop them or teach them or something? And Yehovah said to, uh, to Eli, I told him I would judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. He wouldn't stop them. He didn't correct them. The Shema, you guys know the Shema. It says we're supposed to write the Torah on our gates. That means we have to enforce it. You've got the gates, you come into Perry. It's even worse in the next town over Morris. They, they have cops there, they're totally bored. So it's 25 miles, it goes down from 55. You get a, about 100 feet of 40 miles per hour and then it's 25 and they're bored. So they'll sit behind that fence and wait to give you a ticket and boost up their income. So they enforce it at the gates of their city. And that's what we are supposed to do. We're to write the Torah on the gates of our homes and enforce it. We have to teach it, we have to correct our children when they do wrong, which they do, <laughs> and we have to restrain them from even doing wrong in the first place, okay? Proverbs 29, 15 says, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And it wasn't the mother, but that is exactly what happened to Eli. So going back to Deuteronomy 30, this is a chapter that tells us how to return. So I'm gonna camp out here, okay? Um, let's start down in verse eight. It's a little ways down and it says, when you again obey the voice 
of Yehovah and do all his commandments which I command you today. So to obey his voice is to Shema. Shema Israel. Okay, we're Shema. He wants us to pay attention. So I don't sing like that when I want my kids to pay attention to me. I'm just like, Andrew, get over here, okay, and I just yell at. So we have to teach our children the skill of paying attention when we speak. This is really simple stuff from the Torah. So that they will then learn how to obey the voice of Yehovah when they grow up. So to do that, how do you do that? Well, ask your child to look at you. What does Yehovah say? Turn, your, turn to me. So have your children turn to you, and then... Um, if, you, if they won't turn to you, don't be Eli. Take your hands and turn them to you. This is not hard, okay? You are the parent. You can take their hand. Look at me, okay? And then require, I want you to get your socks. Yes, okay? This is how we do it. And that's how Yehovah does it. How many of you heard his voice and say, I need to keep his Torah? This is what he's doing. If you need to be a shofar to do it, do it. Okay, get your kids to look at you. Don't be like Eli. Teach this and enforce it. Require it. I'm giving you permission. You won't find this at the library. Okay? So when you again obey the voice of Yehovah and do all his commandments which I command you today, you have to require obedience, you have to enforce it and give consequences for disobedience like Yehovah did to Israel. You want the, you want to move them to obey. And I want to look at verse 9 as well for your mothers, in case you think I'm being too strict here. Yehovah will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your fathers, if you obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim. So when your kids do something right, please don't skip this. You need to rejoice over them. That's really important to encourage their hearts. Um, it, it's not just correction and consequences by any means. Like correction and consequences only when they're bad. How much time are they good? Rejoice over them. You know how Yehovah says, um, Yehovah bless you and keep you and turn his face toward you. And make, his face shines and like you walk in the room and Yehovah goes, oh cool, you're here. That's how you should be for your children. Okay, rejoice over them, and you'll, you'll go a long ways towards winning their hearts, but just like he does yours. It's exactly the same. So, um, all right, continuing on. Make sure I'm on the right one. Yes, Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 10. If you obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the Torah, and if you turn to Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, this gives us a definition of what obedience looks like, okay? It's, you want to have, this is your end goal. You want your children to obey with all their heart and with all their soul. And like that little girl, she's like, okay, I can do this. She's got, she's, she's into it. She's really going. That's what you're looking for. I'm not saying that you will get it. You have to kind of move them towards that goal, turn them to it. But you want, that's when you see that, you're seeing good fruit start to come out, okay? Don't just hope for it, though. If they don't have that attitude, require it. Say, I'm sorry, you didn't do that with a happy heart. My mother-in-law, she has dementia now. We were talking about it at lunch, but she was so good with my kids, and she'd, she'd say, have them do something, and they would do it for her so much easier than for me, and, and she would, but it's because she had this really cool manner with them, and she'd say, I like how you did that, but let's crank your ears. And she would like crank them, and of course they'd start smiling, and okay, do it again, let's do it with the crank. You know, and so like that was so cool. So she, that's how you require it. It doesn't have to be yelling at them all the time. I don't mean that at all. But you can require a happy heart. And you might have to model it. You might have to like actually act it out. That's okay, it's fun, okay? So what does the opposite of that look like? This will help you. The opposite of it is a stiff neck, if that will come up, okay? Yehovah spoke to Moses. He said, I have seen this people. Indeed, they are a stiff-necked people. <laughs> you ever seen that in your child? Like, no, I don't want to do it. Okay, you can see the heart condition. You can see it in their body language. So when you see a stiff neck, you're going, oh, dear, that Israel did that, and that was not good. All right, we're going to have to work on that one. You'll know them by their fruit, right? Okay, so in the same way, when you see wholehearted, happy attitude of obedience, and it's coming from your children, you know the fruit is good, and you know you've done something right, okay? 
Yay, once in a while. I mean, it's okay. The Father's rejoicing. You did it right. You went back to the ancient path. So Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 says, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. I like this part. Your children cannot do what they don't know. If you haven't taught it to them, how are they supposed to do it? Um, we have to be proactive and teach our children. So I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say that you have taught your son that he shouldn't take a cookie from the kitchen without asking first, okay? Let's say that's already been done. And you made cookies, and they're in the kitchen, and you're not. And your son, it's like, and he comes in and he wants to have a cookie, and he goes to the kitchen and he sees the container on the counter and it's got the cookies in it. This is what happens in his heart right here. He's got this little forklift, and it drives into his heart, and it goes, and it goes up and down the aisles, and is looking at all the, all the instructions, and they're kind of labeled, and he's looking for anything that has anything to do with cookies. And he sees, because you already have taught him, and so he goes, thou shalt not steal. Oh, man. All right, but he knows, because it's there, you've put it on the shelf in his heart already, so the little forklift comes back out and says, can't have the cookie. He's like, okay, I'll wait. Or maybe he comes and asks you, but at least he doesn't steal it, okay? So what would happen if you had never put anything on the shelf in his heart? So he sees, let's do it again. He sees the cookie, the cookie looks really good. Forklift goes in, drives up and down the aisles. Nothing here, this cookie's yours. And even if it might make you mad, he knows that, there's nothing in his heart that's gonna prevent it, so he grabs the cookie and off he goes, all right? That's just a little illustration, but Psalm 119, nine through 11, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed, Shema, according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So when a small child, you guys have small children somewhere, and they go, why, mommy, why? That's your signal, oh, there's nothing on the shelf. I gotta put something on the shelf right there. Okay, so why is a really helpful word. Now, sometimes it's not appropriate and they need to learn to wait and do it at the right time, and yeah, I get all that, but why, when your child, into like right, what, around three or so, maybe, it depends on the kid, but if they're, if they're around that time and they start saying why to everything, it's your, okay, we're moving to a new spot in parenting now. I've gotta figure out the reason, and I gotta start giving it to them. So that's your job as a parent is to teach them the why so and if at all possible what does it say your word I have hidden my heart your what your word so it's not I mean there are times you're running in front of a truck okay and they, you say mommy said don't do that okay there are times that mommy said so is appropriate in fact children obey your parents you can get away with that once in a while but most of the time you need to give them a real reason don't you hate when people tell you to do what's right and wrong and they don't give you a reason from the bible I hate that so don't do that to your kids and it means a lot of times you won't know the reason so that means you might have to get in proverbs or start getting your strong concordance out and start reading it yourself and making sure you've got notes in a journal and you're starting to categorize things you can do this okay you need to probably fill your moral warehouse as well but don't just tell your kids what to do except for exceptions and emergencies without filling the, the their hearts with the word so let's review it real quick okay you want to teach your children to hear that's the shema you want to teach them to do, that's obey. You want them to be wholehearted or happy-hearted when they do it, and then you don't neglect to teach them why, okay? Do not neglect that. Deuteronomy 30, 15, Yehovah says, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And then down in verse 19, it says, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Just like us, your children are going to have to make their own choices someday. And my children are definitely at this stage of their life now, where they are making their own choices. They have to learn self-control. So the moral warehouse is there, but they have to also do it, okay? And that's hard as a parent to watch them going through these. Sometimes they don't get it just right, and then we have to help them. Um, but it's hard. The lie that the world wants them and you to believe is, they can't help it. They can't help sinning. 
I can't help disobeying. This could be a three-year-old. It could be a 30-year-old. could be me. Um, they say, I can't help it. And if they never learn to control that lie or stomp that lie out, they will grow up believing the lie that they have no control over their decisions. They can't help anything. They can't help getting drunk. They can't help doing drugs. Um, they can't help gluttony and gossip and all the other things. They can't help it. Unrestrained curiosity, can't help it, Mom. I was just on that website. Um, compulsive reactions to other people's behavior, I just couldn't help it, I punched him, Mom. Okay, that's because they need to learn to make choices and hold to the lie, or the truth, that they can choose. Yehovah said, I set before you life and death, choose. You can say that to your kids, okay. These are your choices. I said it before you, but I'm telling you right now, this one's death, okay? Because lies bring spiritual, emotional, physical death to our children, and we, that's the last thing we want as parents. Okay, so for a time when your children are little and they do not have a moral warehouse and they don't know how to choose, there's no word in their heart, you choose for them. Do not let them go off running and making their own choices when they have no ability to do that yet. They don't. They're just taught children. Um, you are the one in, responsible. So you must make their choices until you've established that they will shema and listen to you and obey and establish that they have some self-control and establish that they will be responsible when you're not in the room. My goodness, if I saw my kid not take a cookie and I walked in there and I really realized all that went on in his head that day, I'd probably give him a cookie. I would be so happy because he showed me that he obeyed. He did it without me having to be right there watching. And I would probably give him a little bit more responsibility now and like a little bit more freedom. That's what I meant to say. A little bit more freedom because, wow, you passed the test, which is exactly what Yehovah does with us. That's the point I want you to hear. So most people get this backwards. They give their, their preschoolers all the freedom and they're running everywhere and their teenagers have lost all the privileges and they're grounded. And then the children are jumping out the window and running off, right? So don't get it backwards. You, you be their self-control, but don't stay there. As your children get older, rejoice over them and let them have more freedom. Don't hold them like this all the time. Give them some freedom. Let them make mistakes just like you do. Let, you know, learn from them. Go back to the word. Get more and more freedom as they get more and more ability. It has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with that child and that child's proving that they did what they were supposed to. Um, okay. And you can then set them free as adults and know that his promises are true. They are. So, the truth is, we can choose to obey Hova. Your child can choose to obey. They can. And this path, this is what the word says, this path brings life. And when you walk on that path, you'll find rest for your souls. We don't have rest for your souls at your home right now. It's probably because there's something I said today or something in that passage really is what I'm trying to mean that you're just a little off on. So let's get you back on the right path. If you have to read Deuteronomy 30 every single day, over and over again, just ask the Father, where am I off right here? He'll show you, okay? So if you don't have rest for your souls, the answer is there. It's in his word. And in the result, the fruit that you will see is a home that's filled with love and peace and joy, which is what we're all going for, okay? So that was, that's basically the end. It is the end. I have over 200 hours, guys, of videos on parenting because I can't jam it into a workshop and you're all gonna fall asleep in the afternoon anyway. So I want you to do your homework if you need to go on there and read stuff, get in the word, get in the word and find the answers. If I can help, I'd be happy to. I'm gonna go to a few of the workshops this afternoon also, but then I'll be at my vendor table. Come after this one of the sessions if you need some help, okay? So thank you.